Hello. Our topic for today are beta-lactams, other cell wall, and membrane-active antibiotics. The first of the many series of antibiotics that are gonna learn here in pharmacology. Our lecture for today is divided into five topics. We're gonna begin with beta-lactam compound. The discovery of penicillin is attributed to Sir Alexander Fleming by a Eureka moment in his laboratory. He was the first to suggest that a penicillium mold, now known as penicillium chrysogenum, must secrete an antibacterial substance based on the growth patterns and the clearing observed in his agar plate. He was the first to concentrate the active substance that he was mentioning and he aptly named it penicillin in 1928. Although penicillin is not the first antibiotic per se, it some researchers or some clinicians are calling penicillin as the first true antibiotic because it changed no, the management, treatment, modalities when this was introduced in 1928. Up to This is the basic structure of your penicillin. A represents the thiazolidin ring, and the B represents the beta-lactam ring. In the beta-lactam ring, it carries a secondary amino group, no, or R group here. This A and B uh, are very important for the biologic activity of this group. The R group, that is attached to the beta-lactam ring determines the drug stability to enzymatic or acidic hydrolysis and affects its coverage or antibacterial spectrum. On the other hand, the beta-lactam ring is important for a resist the most popular resistance pattern exhibited in this antibiotic by bacteria, which is hydrolysis by bacterial penicillinase or by acid also known as your beta-lactamases. We will discuss this further when we go to resistance pattern. Now let's go to the different R groups. No? R groups determine again the antibacterial spectrum that the antibiotic provides. So here are some example of those variations in penicillin based on the difference in their R groups. We have penicillin G, penicillin V given for syphilis, oxacillin, dicloxacillin, nafcillin, ampicillin for some sense systemic and local infections, amoxicillin, one of the most, most famous uh, drug under this group, uh, one of the most used drug, and then piperacillin, one of the most important empiric therapies for some systemic or localized infections. And as I've mentioned, one of the most important pattern of resistance against this drug by bacteria is what you call beta-lactamase. They hydrolyze this beta-lactam ring to yield penicillin acid. And this penicillin acid is inert and does not possess any antibacterial activity. There are many drugs that inhibit beta-lactamase, which we use now, no? One of the most famous is the one that you find in coamoxiclab. Coamoxiclab is a formulation of amoxicillin plus clavulanic acid. Amoxicillin is the active antibiotic and clavulanic acid is the one that inhibits beta-lactamases. So now let's go to the mechanism of action of penicillin. Uh, to orient you to your left is a representation of cell wall, specifically the peptidoglycan layer. This peptidoglycan layer is composed of interlinked NAM and NAG, or what you call N-acetylmuramic acid, N-acetylglutamate. And for every layer of this, it is connected by what you call a PEP side chain. And this PEP side chain is the target site of our penicillin. By inhibiting transpeptidation reaction, therefore, this uh, interlinkages will never happen. So let's do a little review about gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Under the microscope, a gram-positive bacteria 
will stain violet because it is able to uh, absorb or get the crystal violet stain upon gram staining. And this is primarily because of the thick peptidoglycan layer in the gram positive bacteria. Some uh, gram positive bacteria have up to 30 layers. And uh, unlike your gram negative bacteria, the gram negative bacteria stains pink because first it will never uh, be stained by the crystal violet and it will absorb the counter stain instead which is the safranin. So gram negative would stain pink and this is because it has a very thin peptidoglycan layer as you represented here and it is still covered by an outer membrane called a lipopolysaccharide membrane or layer. So this is a very important concept that you have to remember. So this is the final step of the formation of your peptidoglycan. So in a the glycopeptide polymer must attach to another glycopeptide polymer. How does it happen? So a transpeptidase reacts to the glycopeptide, removing a uh, terminal D alanine so that it will expose a reaction site. And once this reaction site is already available, the other glycopeptide polymer will now attach to the other glycopeptide polymer, forming your peptidoglycan. So this is the area of action of your penicillins. No? Uh, it inhibits this reaction to happen so that your two glycopeptide polymer will never be attached, rendering your cell wall not rigid or weak. So this is another graphic representation of that reaction. So in the presence of transpeptidase, the interlinkages are allowed to happen, therefore rendering a very strong peptidoglycan layer. So this time naman is what happens when we introduce beta-lactam. And when we introduce beta-lactam, no transpeptidation reaction occurs. Therefore, no interlinkages are happening making the cell wall unstable. So this is a classification of your beta-lactam compounds. So they're classified as natural penicillins, anti-staphylococcal penicillins, extended spectrum penicillins. So the natural penicillins are the ones that we derive from penicillium chrysogenum. And they are your penicillin G, penicillin V, uh, they have activity for both gram-positive uh, and gram-negative and for spirochetes, the causative agent of your syphilis. It is very susceptible to beta-lactamases. Beta-lactamases is one of the resistance patterns against penicillins. Antistaphylococcal penicillins, on the other hand, are chemically synthesized. They are your enafcillin, oxacillin, dicloxacillin. Methicillin is already discontinued because of its very adverse side effect. It has a, it's active against Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. It has little or no activity against Gram negative, and it is very resistant to Staphylococcal beta lactamases, unlike your natural penicillins. The last is your expanded spectrum penicillin. Your, the most famous of this is your amoxicillin. Again, this is chemically synthesized, this time with improved coverage against gram-negative. So it's both for gram-positive and gram-negative. Uh, the examples are amino penicillins, or ampicillin, amoxicillin, and anti pseudomonal penicillins like your piperacillin. They're very susceptible to beta-lactamase. Gram-positive microorganisms are easily penetrated by penicillins, primarily because they have the primary target. They have a very thick peptidoglycan layer, and it is not covered by an outer membrane. On the other hand, gram-negative have outer polysaccharides or lipopolysaccharide membranes that act as a membrane. So how does, um, how does this drug act on gram-negative if they cannot traverse this lipopolysaccharide. So we'll know that in the 
M negative, the idea is that they have porins, no? water-filled channels that permit the transmembrane entry of your penicillin. And therefore, they can act on the peptidoglycan layer. Please take note that also in this figure, there's a representation of your beta-lactamases, which are present in the periplasmic space. And these beta-lactamases are important models of resistance pattern against penicillin. So let's discuss naman the pharmacokinetic profile of penicillin. Uh, let's discuss first administration. Drugs that are only given orally are your penicillin B, amoxicillin, dicloxacillin, IV or IM, ampicillin, solbactam, piperacillin, tazobactam, and the anticephalococcal penicillin, snafcillin, and oxacillin. On depot form are your vencetin and procaine, penicillins, which are formulated to have delays in absorption. So they are slowly absorbing the circulation and they persist at very low levels over a long period of time. And one of the applications of this is, your, again, your syphilis. Absorption of orally administered drug differs greatly for individual penicillins, depending in part on their acid stability and protein binding. In general, the acidic environment within the intestinal tract is unfavorable for absorption of penicillin. So, it's a no-no for penicillins. However, uh, amoxicillin is one of the only exception to this. No? It can be given without regards to meal. Uh, oral penicillin should be given 1 to 2 hours before or after a meal. And they should not be given with food to minimize food binding. Uh, to food proteins and acid inactivate. Uh, distribution uh, is well throughout the body. All penicillins can cause the placental barrier, but none have teratogenic effects, meaning they are able to cross the placental barrier, but they don't do or uh, produce malformation to the growing fetus. So it can be given safely to pregnant patients. And treat into eye, prostate, bone, or CSF is insufficient unless these sites are inflamed. Like in the cases of meningitis. No? The BBB, so it can only cross the blood-brain barrier or the meninges when it is inflamed. These are the different pregnancy categories where clinicians are guided on whether or not they can use a medication to a pregnant patient. These are nice to know for now, but when you go to the clinics and become clinicians, you should be able to differentiate these five categories. Uh, in the modern setting, uh, some countries are already using a different type of uh, pregnancy categories. No? They are actually defining uh, more specific if they have effect in the fetus, if they have effect in lactation, if they have effect in the postpartum period. No? Uh, but right now, this is also acceptable. Excretion of penicillins. Renal is the major route of excretion for this via glomerular filtration and renal tubular secretion. It requires dose adjustment in patients with renal failure or renal problems. This drug may be inhibited by probenicid with subsequent increase in blood levels. Probenicid is a drug used for patients with hyperuricemia. No? Uh, they discovered that uh, when we use this, we increase the availability of penicillin in the body by decreasing the renal excretion. So we utilize this concept in some patients requiring prolonged treatment of penicillin. Uh, biliary, nafcillin is demonstrated to have biliary excretion. Uh, oxacillin, dicloxacillin, and cocosacillin are both renally and biliarily cleared. And it is also expressed in the sputum and the breast milk.
Now let's go to clinical uses of penicillin. Penicillin G is a drug of choice for infections caused by your streptococci, meningococci, some enterococci, penicillin-susceptible pneumococci, and staphylococcal infections confirmed to be non-beta lactamase producing. Uh, Treponema pallidum, which is the causative agent of your syphilis, and other spirochetes, no, like your Lyme diseases. Some Clostridium species, Clostridium difficile, uh, actinomyces, and certain other gram-positive rods, and non-beta lactamase producing gram-negative anaerobic organisms. Uh, Benzidine penicillin and procaine penicillin, the one that are given uh, for prolonged for, by slow infusion and release, uh, are given via IM. Uh, they yield low but for prolonged drug levels in the body. And they are useful for cases of streptococcal, pharyngitis, and syphilis. Penicillin is resistant to staphylococcal beta-lactamases, no? like your meticillin, nafcillin, and isoxazolyl penicillins. These are used for infections caused by beta-lactamase producing staphylococci, penicillin-susceptible strains of streptococci and pneumococci. Dicloxacillin, mild to moderate localized staphylococcal infections. Now, oxacillin and naxosinafcillin naman are for serious staphylococcal infections like your endocarditis. Penicillin, the first anti-staphylococcal penicillin to be developed, is no longer used clinically, uh, not because of the resistance pattern, although it has a high resistance pattern as well, but this is mainly because of its adverse side effects. Extended spectrum penicillins or amino penicillins, which is amoxicillin, carboxypenicillin, urido penicillins. They have greater activity against gram negative, but of course they also have activity for gram positive. Do not discount that. Ampicillin and amoxicillin uh, are the most active of the oral beta lactam antibiotics against pneumococci and are preferred for treating infection suspected to cause by these strains, like your pneumonia. No, amoxicillin is given orally to treat bacterial sinusitis, otitis, lower respiratory tract infections, some forms of UTI in the pregnant patients as well. Ampicillin, uh, but not amoxicillin, is effective for shigellosis. The determinant for penicillin is your penicilloic acid. No? These are products of alkaline hydrolysis bound to host protein. Remember that penicilloic acid has no anti- bacterial property. Less than 1% of persons person who previously received penicillin without incident will remain to have an allergic reaction when given penicillin again. Because of the potential of anaphylaxis, penicillin should be administered with caution if the person has a history or serious penicillin uh, of serious penicillin allergy. So it's either you test the patient first or you choose another drug to give to this patient. If penicillin must be administered, the sensitization must be done. Jerish Kirchheimer reaction is a reaction found on patients traditionally being treated with penicillin for syphilis. Uh, it usually manifests one to three hours after the introduction of antibiotics. And usually patients will present fever, chills, rigors, hypotension, tachycardia, hyperventilation, myalgia, and exacerbation of the present skin lesions. Um, this is secondary to uh, when, the, when the microorganism starts to die or burst, from the introduction of the antibiotic and the toxin-like products are released and therefore resulting in systemic inflammatory response. Uh, another condition where we see this systemic inflammatory response is sepsis. That's why patients with syphilis who are given penicillin are actually admitted to observe and manage this re expected reaction. Uh, this disease or this reaction is also present in some uh, in some other antibiotics no? but traditionally again associated with syphilis 
So there are four resistance patterns that we know for penicillin. The most famous is the inactivation of antibiotic by beta-lactamase, and this is the most common. Modification of target PBP. This is un underlies the methicillin resistance in staph filococci and of penicillin resistance in pneumococci and most resistant enterococci. And the third one is impaired penetration of drug to target PBPs or penicillin binding proteins in gram negative, no? And then antibiotic efflux. So this is an example of your antibiotic efflux. When the drug is able to cross the outer membrane and the cytoplasmic membrane, uh, will eventually face what we call an efflux transporter. And this efflux transporter transport you know, your antibiotic from inside to outside of the bacteria. And this is a classic example of the resistance patterns exhibited to penicillin. Now, we go to cephalosporins and cephamycins. So, cephalosporins was initially discovered by Mr. Brotsu. Uh, he isolated this compound from the acrimonium, previously known as your cephalosporium. That's why it's named cephalosporin in 1945. Found in the sea near a sewage outfall in Susiku, uh, in Sardinia, Italy. The actual name of your cephalosporin is 7-amino cephalosporonic acid. It is very stable or more stable to many bacterial beta-lactamases and has broader spectrum of activity. It has two sites of attachment for various R1 and R2 groups and they, they play very different functions from different drugs. The R1 group found in the 3' prime position is responsible for the pharmacokinetic profile of this drug. And the R group at the 7' prime position is what alters the antibacterial activity or coverage of the drug. These are the different or uh, various R groups present in your different cephalosporins. They are just nice to So when we talk about classifications of cephalosporin, you call them first generation, second generation, third generation, or fourth generation. There's also a newer classification, the fifth generation, and we will discuss that later. So let's discuss first generation. The drugs under this first generation are cefazolin, cefadroxil, cefalexin, cefalothin, cefafirin, cefradin. The coverage of this first generation is gram-positive cocci, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Proteus mirabilis. For second generation drugs, there you have Cefaclor, Cefamandol, Cefonicid, Cefuroxime, Cefprosil, Lorazarfeb, and Cefuranidin. The coverage of this is same as for first gen, but this time with extended gram negative activity, no? like your Klebsiella, which is Klebsiella pneumonia. H. influenzae or Haemophilus influenzae, Bacteroides fragilis, and Syracha. This does not confer any activity against Enterobacter. Third generation drugs are Cefotaxime, Ceftazidime, Ceftixoxime, Ceftrioxin, Cefixime, Cefodoxim, Proxetil, Cefdinir, Cefditoren, Ceftibutin, Moxalactam, and Cefoperazone. The, ex the coverage of this third generation is your gram-negative uh, with the coverage to Citrobacter, Seracia, Providentia, Neusodomonas, no? especially Ceftazidem. Um, some of these are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and it's not useful for Enterobacter. Moxalactam and Cefoperazone are no longer commercially used today. The fourth generation are your cefepime. And the coverage of fourth generation is Pseudomonas enterobacteriaceae, methicillin-susceptible S. aureus or Staph aureus, 
Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus, and Neisseria species. They are able to penetrate well into the CSF, and this time they are useful for treatment of Enterobacter infections. So why do you think they were named uh, first generation, second generation, and third generation? So they were cl actually classified two generations because of, of their increasing or expanding coverage against gram-negative, no? specifically against gram-negative. Uh, so these are some of the cephalosporin generalities that you have to know. First generation cephalosporins are predominantly active against gram positives, with succeeding generation progressively more active against gram negative strain, often with reduced gram positive activity, except for the fourth generation, which are extended spectrum. Cephalosporins are lame because they are inactive against, no, so these are the draw, they, they don't work on this. Uh, L for a listeria, A for atypicals. M for methicillin resistant staph or use, except for septarolin, no? And enterococcus. So what is that septarolin? So oral, we have a ferroxime, acetyl, the most common oral second generation, cephalosporin. For IV or IM, we have a cephalosporin, the only first generation parenteral cephalosporin in use. IV or IM route is not ideal for second generation because of the pain associated in the injection site. Absorption, they are poorly, poor, poorly absorbed orally. Hence, many of the cephalosporins must be administered IV or IM. So for distribution, cephalosporin, the first generation uh, drugs, it penetrates well into most tissues except for the CNS. Uh, third generation cephalosporins and cephepime penetrate body fluids and tissues well, including CSF, achieving levels in the cerebrospinal fluid sufficient to inhibit most susceptible pathogens. So now we talk about excretion. First generation, second generation, and third generation, and fourth generation, except for the third generation ceftriaxin, requires dose adjustments in renal failure. And they, again, are acted upon by probenicid, which will increase their blood levels. Again, probenicid is a drug against hyperuricemia or against uric acid. Biliary excretion, except trioxone, which is a third generation. Well, let's go to clinical uses. For first generation, uh, first generation generally should never be relied for serious systemic infection. So most probably, it's only used for localized infections like your UTI, Staphylococcus strep infections limited to one organ including cellulitis or soft tissue abscesses. Cefasolin, another drug under this, is used for surgical prophylaxis, uh, stop or strep infections requiring IV therapy. Um, this is better tolerated than anti-staphylococcal penicillins, effective for serious staphylococcal infections, and can also be used with patients with mild penicillin allergies. In generation drugs, we use them against beta-lactamase producing Haemophilus influenzae or Moraxera catarrhalis, responsible for sinusitis, otitis, and lower respiratory tract infections. Also, we use second-gen drugs for mixed anaerobic infections like your peritonitis, diverticulitis, and pelvic inflammatory diseases. Cefurexime is used to treat CAP or community-acquired pneumonia. Third generation cephalosporins, the clinical uses are as follows. Ceftriaxin given via IM in combination with isitromycin is a regimen of choice for treating most gonococcal infections. No? Uh, ceftriaxone and cefetoxime are approved for treatment of meningitis caused by pneumococci, meningococci, H. influenzae, and susceptible enteric gram-negative bacilli. Empirical therapy of sepsis in both the immunocompetent and the immunocompromised patient and treatment of infections for which a cephalosporin is the least toxic drug available. Now let's go to fourth generation cephalosporins. The clinical uses of the fourth generation cephalosporins are as follows. 
no good activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Enterobacteriaceae, Mirsa or methicillin resistant susceptible, S. aureus, and S. pneumoniae. Highly active against Haemophilus species and Hypsiria species. Because of its broad spectrum of activity, CFFIM is commonly used to, um, for empirical treatment in patients presenting with febrile neutropenia in combination with other drugs. Because Let's go to advanced generation cephalosporin. Now, sometimes this is called fifth generation cephalosporin. Ceftarolin fosamil is a pro-drug of the active drug ceftarolin. No? It's the first drug approved for the clinical use against Mirsa or methicillin-resistant staphylococci. So the brand name of this drug is Teflaro and it's given IV. Now let's go to adverse drug reactions of cephalosporin. Number one, hypersensitivity. So patients with documented penicillin allergy or anaphylaxis have an increased chance of reacting with cephalosporin. Overall, the frequency of cross allergenicity uh, is low at 1%. No? Cross allergenicity is due to the shared similar R1 side chain among drugs, not the beta lactam ring. The highest rate of allergic cross sensitivity is between penicillin and first generation cephalosporin. So, kung, if we can use other drugs for these kinds of patients, we opt to do so. Now, let's go to adverse reaction of cephalosporin renal, interstitial nephritis, and tubular necrosis, hematologic hyperprotombinemia, and bleeding disorders like cefata tetan, cefamandol, cefmetazole, and cefoperazone. Local irritation and pain when given IM is also one of the major complaints of patients, and thromboplebitis via IV. So do you recall the resistance patterns we've dis been discussing in penicillin? These are also one of this is your beta lactamases, and this is also present in your cephalosporins as well. So fortunately, we're able to make a drug that works against these beta lactamases. So these beta lactamase inhibitors resembles beta lactam molecules, but they have very weak antibacterial action. Combined with beta lactam antibiotics, so that they can be protected from beta lactamase and therefore preventing them from being inactive. Beta lactamase inhibitors are available only in fixed combinations, no, with specific penicillins and cephalosporins. One of the most famous that I've discussed with you repeatedly is your coamoxiclab. Coamoxiclab is a combination of amoxicillin, the drug. No and glavulanic acid or clavulanate, and that is your beta lactamase inhibitor. So, the other beta lactamase inhibitor that we use is our sulbactam, tazobactam, and abibactam. So, now we proceed to the third, the other beta lactam drug. So, the first of these drugs are your monobactams, so named because of their monocyclic beta lactam ring. The coverage is limited to aerobic gram-negative organisms. Astrenam is the only monobactam available for use commercially. Penicillin-allergic patients tolerate astrenam very well without reactions. But patients uh, with tazidime hypersensitivity uh, are warned no, with caution in using, in using astrenam because of their structural similar similarity. Therefore, there's potential for cross the activity. Um, major toxicity is very uncommon for this uh, for this drug, but occasional skin rashes, elevation of serum amino transferases, like your AST ALT occur during administration. So Astrian is used in patients with a history of penicillin anaphylaxis or allergy to treat infections. Serious infections like pneumonia, meningitis, and sepsis caused by susceptible gram-negative pathogens. The next is your carbapenem. The coverage are your gram-negative rods, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 
gram-positive organisms, and anaerobics. They are resistant to most beta-lactamases. And the example of these drugs are your doripenem, ertapenem, imipenem, and meropenem. Imipenem is combined with silastatin, which inhibits the hydropeptidases enzyme in renal tubules that inhibit imipenem. They penetrate CSF well, except for ertapenem. The excretion are usually renal, and those is adjusted for renal insufficiency. The adverse effect of carbapenem, gastrointestinal, produces nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, skin rashes, reactions at the infusion site. Neurologic excessive levels, uh, more commonly with imipenem in patients with renal failure, may lead to seizures. Hypersensitivity, patients allergic to penicillins may be allergic to carbapenem, but the incidence of cross-reactivity is to be less than 1%. Now let's go to glycopeptide antibiotic. Famous of this glycopeptide antibiotics is vancomycin. It is isolated from the bacterium aminocalaptosis orientalis. The coverage of this drug is uh, it acts as a bactericidal against gram positive cocci and anaerobics, uh, like your Enterococcus facium. A uh, similar drug is named stacoplanin. Vancomycin, the mode of action is that it binds to the D-alanine, D-alanine terminus of the amino acid peptide, therefore inhibiting cross-linkages, which is similar to your, the rest of your penicillin. Key parameter of vancomycin are as follows. Administration, it is poorly absorbed orally, so it is only given orally for the treatment of colitis caused by Clostridium difficile, and mostly are given via IV. The distribution, it is widely distributed in the body, including fats or adipose tissues. It penetrates CSF in the presence of meningeal inflammation. So when the BBB is inflamed or the meninges is in inflamed, it can cross the CSF. Excretion, renal, in the presence of renal. Insufficiency, therefore, so they require those adjustments. The clinical use of this drug is as follows. No bloodstream infections and endocarditis caused by MIRSA. No, when we talk about vancomycin, it's always associated with methicillin-resistant saphilococci. No, so sepsis or endocarditis caused by methicillin-resistant Staphylococci. So men meningitis suspected or known to be caused by a penicillin resistant strain of pneumococcus is another indication. So, what are the adverse reactions expected from vancomycin? It's irritating to tissues, resulting in plebitis at the site of injection. Chills and fever may also occur. So, autotoxicity is rare, but nephrotoxicity is still encountered regularly with current preparations, especially with high throw levels. Uh, rough level or throw levels are concentration at which it is at lowest reached by a drug before the next dose is administered. This is often used in therapeutic drug monitoring or modeling and some clinical trials. No? Administration with another autotoxic or nephrotoxic drug just as your aminoglycosides will increase the risk of toxicity. So we avoid or be wary of this uh, toxicity. So there are three drugs under semi-synthetic like peptide antibiotics. These are Televancin, Dalbavancin, and Oritavancin. So semi-synthetic lipoglycopeptide derived from vancomycin uh, that's your tela, vancine, that's why they share a same, almost similar structure, and tacoplanin, which are, which uh, the is the basis of your telpa, vancine, and orito, vancine. The mechanism of action of this drug is that they inhibit cell wall synthesis, they're helping cell membrane potential, and it inhibits RNA synthesis. The coverage is limited to gram-positive bacteria. The clinical uses of these drugs are your complicated skin and soft tissue infections and hospital-acquired pneumonia or HAP. The adverse reactions are nephrotoxicity and they have a very high teratogenic potential. So avoid in pregnancy. 
So for the last part of our lecture, the other cell wall or membrane active agents. So daptomycin. Daptomycin is a fermentation product of streptomyces roseosporosus. The coverage is similar to vancomycin. However, uh, it is more active against vancomycin-resistant strains of enterococci and staphylococcus aureus. In vitro, it has more rapid bactericidal activity than vancomycin. The precise mechanism of action of this drug is not fully understood. But the uh, accepted mechanism right now is that the polarization of the cell membrane with potassium efflux and rapid cell membrane death. So the excretion is renal. The adverse reactions uh, are in your myopathy. So you need to monitor CK, CPK levels, allergic pneumonitis in patients receiving prolonged therapy for more than two weeks. Pulmonary surfactant, no? antagonizes daptomycin, so should not be used to treat pneumonia. So again, the aforementioned mechanism of action remains to be not fully understood. Right now, what we know is that this drug is known to bind to the cell membrane by a calcium-dependent insertion with its lipid tail. And this will re eventually result in the polarization of the cell membrane with potassium cell, potassium efflux from the cell and rapid cell death. So how does this happen step by step? So daptomycin first binds to the cytoplasmic membrane represented by step 1 and then forms complexes in a calcium-dependent manner rep uh, represented by steps 2 and steps 3. The complex produced in this uh, steps 2 and 3 causes a rapid loss of cellular potassium. And cellular, possibly, it's secondary to a pore formation. And therefore, when potassium comes out, no, the positive um, molecule potassium comes out of the cell, membrane depolarization occurs. And therefore, DNA, RNA, protein synthesis is arrested or inhibited, resulting in cell death. However, even if there's a pore information, please take note that cell lysis will not or does not occur in this drug. So phosphomycin is an analog of phosphophenol pyruvate or PEP. It is structurally unrelated to any other antimicrobial agent. It inhibits a very early stage of bacterial cell wall synthesis, which is the addition of phosphoenol pyruvate to UDPN acetylglucosamine. The coverage of this drug is gram positive and gram negative. Excretion renal with urinary concentrations exceeding the minimum inhibitory concentration for most urinary tract pathogens. The clinical use of this drug is that it's approved for use for a single 3 gram dose for treatment of uncomplicated lower UTI in uh, in women. Bacitracin obtained from the Tracy strain of Bacillus subtilis in 1943. It is used for gram-positive microorganisms and the mechanism of action inhibits cell wall formation by interfering with the lipid carrier that transfers peptidoglycan subunits to the growing cell wall. So it's a clinical the clinical use of this drug is topical antibiotics, no? Bacitracin, no? it's a very famous topical antibiotic. Uh, adverse reaction, highly nephrotoxic when administered systemically. So that's why it's only used topically. Hypersensitivity should not be applied to open wounds, no, to avoid this reaction. Cyclocerine. Cyclocerine is produced by streptomyces aurichidiosus. The mechanism of action is that it inhibits incorporation of D-alanine into peptidoglycan pemtapeptide by inhibiting alanine racemase, which converts L-alanine to D-alanine and D-alanine ligase. The pharmacokinetics, this is widely distributed in tissues, excreted in the urine. The clinical use of this drug is that it's used no, as a secondary drug for the treatment of tuberculosis. 
caused by strains of MTB resistant to the first line agents. The adverse reactions expected from this drug is your headaches, tremors, acute psychosis, and convulsion. So mostly neurologic yung mga side effects. So that is the end of our beta-lactam and other cell wall and membrane active antibiotics. So if you have questions or clarifications, contact me at my Twitter account. No, Send me a tweet at Carl Ablola. Or you can send me an email at caseyablola at usd.edu.ph. So don't be shy. Just share your questions anytime. And I'll try my, to answer your questions as soon as I can. So again, uh, have a great day ahead. And I hope everyone is doing well. And I hope you're all staying at home and staying healthy. So goodbye class.